Whatever your views are on the current state of DVD's balance, there is no denying that most things about the game are in a fairer place than they used to be. Of course, the game isn't perfect, but there's a lot less room for people to exploit certain mechanics for the sole purpose of bullying their opponents and ruining their day. Funnily enough though, if you were to ask an old school DVD player how they feel about the old days of the game, you'll get one of two drastically different answers. Either, this game used to be absolutely miserable, it's a miracle this game even grew a player base, or DVD used to be so fun, it's a shame they nerfed all the fun stuff. What's the reason for this? Find out after this message from today's sponsor, Opera GX. We all know that DVD is not the most optimized game out there and you need to squeeze out every extra frame you can get. So when you're watching videos or your favorite streamers while playing, why use a browser that eats up all your resources when you can use Opera GX and the built-in GX control panel to limit how much of your CPU and RAM the browser can use so your frame rate doesn't get bogged down when gaming. Or for those of you who struggle with slow internet, you can also limit how much bandwidth Opera GX uses, so you can maintain a balance between watching streams and staying lag-free in your matches. Sick of getting flashbanged every time you open a site and wasting time scrolling through each individual site's settings to enable dark mode? Well, once again, Opera GX has got you covered with the ability to force dark mode on every single page. And just when you thought they had it all, there's also Discord and Twitch integrations built into the browser too, so you can stay connected to all your servers and never miss your favorite streamer with notifications whenever a streamer you follow goes live. And to top it all off, there's the GX Corner, an area curated by the Opera GX team to help you find all of the newest and best free games, amazing price deals, and gaming news all in one place. You can install Opera GX now with the link in the description or the pinned comment. Well, depending on what role that person played, Either of those previously mentioned statements could be true to an extent. One role got to experience a power trip unlike any other offered in a multiplayer game, but the other role was on the receiving end of that. So let me tell you about the downfall of bully squads, what enabled them, what they were capable of, and the changes that eventually led to the extinction of a once feared playstyle. To start things off, let's talk about how bully squads actually operated. They were most often teams of three to four friends who would play together while on voice comms with the sole intention of trolling, harassing, and overall just ruining their opponent's day. However, this would not be done by outplaying the killer or playing well to cause the frustration of defeat. In fact, quite the opposite. These squads would often straight up ignore their objectives, refuse to repair gens, and not even attempt to escape in favor of keeping the killer stuck in the match for as long as possible whilst absolutely tormenting them. For instance, intentionally triggering glitches that would permanently stop the killer from being able to move, glitching out of bounds into spots where the killer could never possibly reach them, abusing infinite loops, and some of the many broken items, add-ons, and perks survivors had over the years. Let's start off with the core tactics of movement-based shenanigans. Even in those early days of the game, the community figured out looping pretty quickly. While your standard pallet looping and window looping was already commonplace, it was quite different to the way loops play out nowadays. This was due to a combination of a significantly slower pallet break speed and window vault speed for killers, alongside maps and the pallet spawning system being significantly different to how they are now. Mainly, maps were larger overall, there were significantly more pallets and windows, safer pallets in general, and survivors could straight up blink like the nurse with a mechanic called pallet vacuum. Nowadays, if you're sprinting towards a pallet, you can press the drop button before you're at the pallet and the game will queue up the input to drop it as soon as you're in range. With pallet vacuum, however, if you were to press the drop button from out of range, instead of queuing it, it would instantly teleport the survivor to the far side of the pallet and drop it at the same time. Now, survivors being able to literally teleport does sound absolutely crazy, and that's because it absolutely was. Just like how crazy it is that nearly 85% of people watching this aren't subscribed. If you're enjoying this, don't forget to subscribe as there's loads more videos just like this on my channel. So, pair pallet teleportation with a ludicrous amount of safe pallets and matches were already frustrating for killers even when people were playing fairly. But bully squads had one issue with this. Even with lots of pallets and the ability to literally teleport when dropping pallets, Pallets are finite, so that means it would be possible for killers to actually win the game, 
eventually, if they dropped all the pallets. And we can't have that now, can we? Luckily for them, there were bugs in the game that solved that problem, introducing infinite loops. Loops that were, as the name implies, infinite, meaning that no matter how long the match goes on for, if a survivor runs that loop, they would never die. How infinite loops would work was typically by having a really good window on a long loop with line of sight blockers. Bloodlust originally wasn't even a thing in the game, but it was added later in an attempt to get rid of infinite loops. However, due to the loops being long and having line of sight blockers, the survivor could continue running the loop while not being in the killer's line of sight, and that would in turn register as them no longer being in chase, thus preventing bloodlust gain. The strong window would offset any distance the killer gained on the survivor, and due to the loop being long, the window wouldn't get blocked as too much time had occurred since the previous vault. Again, due to the loops being very long, it was pretty much impossible for killers to mind game or counter rotate any of them. While the explanation may make infinite loops sound super complicated, functionally it was as simple as running any other standard window loop. Some of you may be thinking of an obvious solution. If a survivor were to run an infinite loop, drop chase with them and go for someone else. And in the case of a lone survivor using infinite loops in a normal public match, that would work just fine. But in the case of bully squads, all four of them would be aware of the infinite loop and would happily use it. So switching targets would achieve nothing. While infinite loops were effectively god mode, that still wasn't enough for some people. While the killer would never be able to win the match against a full team using infinite loops, the killer could still play, which, of course, was absolutely unacceptable. So, depending on the map, bully squads would resort to abusing a bug that allowed survivors to outright disable the killer's ability to move and would have the killer trapped in one spot indefinitely. The bug was patched, after years, but how it worked was by having a survivor stood underneath a hole, not an open drop like a hill, specifically a hole, and then getting a killer to drop down said hole. This would typically be done by having one person waiting there already, then having somebody else in chase bring the killer to said hole. The person in chase would drop down the hole and wouldn't get stuck. Then the killer would drop down in pursuit and would instead find themselves stuck on top of the first survivor's head, completely unable to move. Back in the day, I personally had a bully squad use this glitch on me in the original Crotus Pren Asylum map, which, at the time, was home to the easiest infinite loop in DBD in the main building. They held me hostage for 15 minutes and repaired an astounding two generators in that time, most likely because they expected the killer to leave the match instead of sticking around. After 15 minutes, I assume they got bored because they let me go, but other people at the time wouldn't be let go quite as quickly, with some people being held hostage for 30 minutes or even hours if they didn't quit. To round off the movement-based stuff, there were dead hard bounce glitches. Very similar to the COD 4 bounce glitches from back in the day, Dead Hard bounces were achieved with the old Dead Hard's dash as it applied a tremendous amount of acceleration. So, by Dead Harding off of an edge and hitting another edge at the right angle, it would then in turn bounce the survivor upwards and allow them to land on other objects. Depending on the map, location, and what object the survivor landed on, it could render the survivor totally unkillable as they'd simply be too high up for killers to reach. This of course meant that it was another tool bully squads could use to become completely unkillable or even hold the game hostage. In the interest of fairness, I think it is important to note that the dead hard bounce glitches were nowhere near as common as a lot of the other stuff on this list as the glitches weren't in many maps and not as many people knew about them. While everything I just mentioned were powerful tools in the arsenal of a bully squad, capable of making any match completely unwinnable, those weren't the things that built bully squads such an infamous reputation. Instead of abusing infinite loops and bugs, it was instead the mechanics that were intentionally added into the game by behaviour that stung the worst. Let's start off with the most famous, or I guess infamous, insta-blinds. The insta-blind flashlights did exactly what you'd expect they'd blind the killer instantly. While nowadays you're pretty much only ever blinding the killer if they're stuck in an animation, like breaking a pallet or picking up a survivor, with insta-blinds it was fast enough that a survivor could flick it at the killer mid-chase and immediately get results. Since insta-blinds made it so you wouldn't need to turn the flashlight on for as long, they also acted as battery add-ons since it would use like half as much juice for each blind, which also meant they wouldn't run out quickly and it would be a nuisance the killer would have to deal with all match long. 
It wasn't just an annoyance thing either, it severely shifted the balance of the match even further in the survivor's favour as it completely removed all timing needed for flashlight saves, and positioning too for that matter. As soon as the killer finished picking up the survivor, one click of the beamer and boom, the victim is saved. Even back in those days, good killer plays knew to face a wall whenever picking up a survivor to counter flashlight saves. But with bully squads, that was simply not an option, as when a survivor knew they were about to go down, they would run out into the open to ensure there were no walls nearby for the killer to protect themselves with. The rescue was almost guaranteed. Bully squads would run multiple insta-blinds and would spam the living daylights out of the killer almost non-stop all match long, and there really wasn't much the killer could do about it. Franklin's demise didn't exist back then, and Lightborn wasn't like how it is nowadays. It didn't make the killer unblindable, and instead just made it take 60% longer to blind them, with the added downside of making the killer's vision permanently darker, and that was really not viable for a reason I'll get into later. There's a lot to say about Instablind flashlights, but I won't go into too much detail as I already made an entire video dedicated to them, where a team of survivors bullied the game director for DBD so hard that Instablinds got completely removed within a month. The match was absolute torment. I'll link that video in the description. Next up, the old version of the brand new part. Even nowadays, brand new parts are ridiculously powerful, being able to repair 15% of a gen in a ridiculously short time and stacking with the base toolbox itself is a huge boost to your objective pressure. But back in the old days of DBD, it was a little bit better. First of all, it didn't require any skill checks to use. You just right click to gen and the brand new parts effect would instantly activate, which of course is strong as the killer couldn't interrupt it. But additionally, instead of repairing 15% of a gen, it was 100% of a gen. That's right, with a single button press, an entire generator would be completed instantly, and there was literally nothing killers could do about it. It couldn't be interrupted, there was no Franklin's demise, there was no corrupt intervention, it was physically impossible to prevent it. And of course, as it was simply an add-on for toolboxes, all four survivors could use it, which did of course mean that if a full team had brand new parts, the killer could lose four gens within only a few seconds of the match starting. While instantly losing 80% of your objectives as soon as the game starts is certainly a sting that would sour the mood of anybody wanting a fair and fun match, it would also mean that the match, and therefore your torment, would be over quickly and then you could go ahead to the next game. So Bully Squads devised a new plan, instead focused on causing as much misery as possible. First of all, if the entire team used brand new parts, that means they wouldn't have any room for Instablind flashlights, and Instablind flashlights were very high on their priority list due to how frustrating they were and how long they lasted. So if they weren't running four Instablinds, they'd use one brand new part. Instead of using it at the start of the game like previously mentioned, they'd save it for the very last gen, but they wouldn't just use it as soon as there was one gen remaining. They would instead opt to drag things out for as long as possible. Abusing infinite loops, spamming insta-blinds, insta-healing, abusing certain perks which I'll get into later, teabagging, the whole lot. And if somehow, by some miracle, the killer began to get some pressure and it started looking like the match was playable, boom, brand new part on the final gen and all of that pressure instantly meant nothing as the game was now over. They were giving the killer some hope just to snatch it all away and cause as much tilt as possible. But that final gen being instantly repaired would not be the final kick in the balls as there was still more to come. I'll explain later in the video. Continuing the trend of broken items and add-ons, we have insta-heals, plural. That's right, there were two different insta-heal add-ons, the anti-hemorrhagic syringe and the styptic agent. While most people still refer to the syringe as an insta-heal nowadays, it instead functions as an auto-heal, which is what I call it. You apply it with the skill check button and then you're free to walk, sprint, vault, do gens, etc. And after 16 seconds, you heal up one health state. I think you can all see where this is going. Let's take the old styptic agent for example. When you press the skill check button to use it, there was no 16 second wait. The moment you press that button, you were instantly healed a full health state. So from injured to full health or from downed to injured. So, what did the syringe do then? Again, the moment you pressed the button, you were instantly healed, 
but for two health states. With a single button press, you could take a downed survivor to full health. Again, no 16 second delay, it was the instant you pressed that button. This of course meant that if the killer managed to get an injury mid chase, the survivor would immediately drop a pallet, after teleporting to the other side, insta heal in the killer's face, teabag a couple times, and then continue with their antics. Even if the bully squad made some severe mistakes and the killer got a sliver of pressure, all of that pressure would instantly be reset with the use of an insta heal, and again, there was nothing the killer could do about it. Sloppy Butcher didn't have any effect, there was no Franklin's demise, it was simply unavoidable. Now, although the effect of an insta heal was ungodly powerful, it was only a one time use, so even still, it was not as popular as the previously mentioned insta blind flashlights. Insta heals were definitely far more popular than brand new parts, though, as it was far easier to heal in a killer's face than it was to use a brand new part in the killer's face. Because once again, the goal for bully squads was often not winning, but bullying the killer as much as possible. And to finish up the broken items and add ons, we have the old keys. Nowadays, keys aren't particularly valuable. On the rare occasion you see anyone using it, it's just to see the auras of other players. But in the past, keys were one of the strongest items in the game, even without any add ons. This was because, paired with the old hatch mechanics, survivors could escape the match early without even doing all the gens, and it wasn't restricted to just the last survivor alive either. You see, in the past, the hatch would spawn even when multiple survivors were alive, and even if there were still gens left to repair, but it wouldn't be open. The formula worked like this. The hatch would spawn if one gen was done, plus one more gen for each alive survivor. So, two alive survivors required three gens to be complete, three survivors required four gens to be complete, and so on. So, by bringing in a purple or red key, survivors could escape without even completing their objective. That's right, they could win without winning. Similar to the brand new part situation, keys could be used to snatch away the killer's last hope, but once again, winning wasn't really the goal, so most bully squads would prefer to bring in more insta blinds. Now let's get into the meat of the bully squad's arsenal, the perks. In the past, the perk meta was incredibly stale and remained the same for years at a time. There was one single build for survivors that was incredibly unfair as it covered every possible situation all in one and provided a second chance for every single one of those situations. The build was Decisive Strike, Borrow Time, Unbreakable, and Deadard. While you may be familiar with all of those perks and how they function today, in the past they were different and far, far stronger. With the exception of Unbreakable, which functioned the same as it does nowadays but with slightly different numbers. These perks were so ungodly overpowered and or hated in the past that I've already made dedicated videos for each individual perk, with the exception of Unbreakable as once again it hasn't really changed much. So, what exactly made this build so overpowered, and why did it become the default build for bully squads for years to come? Well, each of these perks would completely nullify whatever the killer tried to do, effectively resetting all of the killer's pressure whenever they were used. Here's how a match would go with this build. Killer hits the survivor once, survivor deadhards the second hit, killer hits them a third time, and then the survivor goes down. As soon as the survivor gets put on the killer's shoulder, boom, an instant decisive strike, which used to be permanently active no matter what for a single use, and have a longer stun, which would then free the survivor and reset the chase again, and that entire chase achieved absolutely nothing for the killer. That's right, if all four survivors had decisive strike back then, which was very common even in matches that weren't against bully squads, that meant all survivors would get a guaranteed proc on their first down whether they had been hooked or not. And it didn't even matter if they were the obsession or not originally. Okay, so if picking up survivors gets you hit with decisive strike, then you must be better off downing a survivor and leaving them slugged, right? Nope, because then they'd be able to revive themselves with Unbreakable and reset everything once again. Okay, so you get through the dead hard, you've taken the decisive strike, and then you've downed the same survivor a second time, so you finally get to hook them. Oh look, the survivor's teammate has immediately rushed for the unhook. That's fine, if they unhook in front of the killer, then that will end up being a trade. Nope. 
because old borrowed time would apply to both the unhooked person and the person unhooking them. So they're instantly unhooked, resetting any pressure you would have from having someone immobilized, and the unhooker doesn't get traded either. So once again, another full pressure reset. As you could imagine, dealing with that build as killer was incredibly frustrating. No matter what you did, you were going to get punished for it whether you made the right play or not. And that's just if you were playing any random match against someone with that meta build. Now, if you were to take the same meta build and apply it to all four members of a bully squad, that meant that alongside more pallets, pallet teleporting, infinite loops, hostage taking, insta blinds, insta heals, teabagging, and faster base gen speeds, you'd also have anything you did completely nullified one time per survivor. And believe me, we are not done yet. Remember earlier when I said Lightborn's darkened screen was just not an option for killers in terms of dealing with insta-blinds? That's because not only were maps darker in general back in those days, there were also extra offerings called Moonlight offerings, which could either brighten or darken the map significantly. And I really do mean significantly. It was so frustrating just to be in a match with the darkest Moonlight offering as it was so hard to spot any survivors. And, of course, the darkest moonlight offering could also be paired with the thickest fog offering to make things even worse. Do you know how hard it is to deal with a survivor you can't even see abusing an infinite loop? Because old school killers do, and it is not fun to say the least. The last in-game tactic worth mentioning was the old school sabotage squads and 99%ing hooks. In the past, hook sabotaging worked slightly differently to how it does now. In the present day, if you let go of the sabotage button before it's complete, then all progress is lost. But in the past, the progress would simply pause. While it did take a bit longer to sabotage hooks in the past, what survivors could do is preemptively set up all the hooks on the map to be 99% sabotaged and then simply instantly finish it if the killer was about to hook someone on it. This was, once again, another case of giving killers hope and then swiping it away from them at the last minute. And again, there was no Franklin's demise, so there wasn't anything the killer could really do about it. I've already mentioned that bully squads didn't really have much interest in winning, instead often opting to let the killer win. While part of the reason for this was because they already had their fun in bullying and tormenting the killer for the entire match and that was all they really cared about, there was also another reason many opted to lose, and that was to derank. DBD's old matchmaking system was even more laughable than the one it has nowadays. In the past, ranks would go from 20, being the lowest, what a fresh account would start on, to rank 1, where the people who played the game most often would be. So, if someone was to be at a lower rank, they would often face new players, and a survivor dying was often enough to count as a loss and therefore a D-rank. Once again, I'm sure you can see where this is going. For some of these bully squads, infinite loops, 4 second chance perks, glitches, etc etc were still not enough. They still felt the need to de-rank in order to torment new players. And this absolutely did stop people from sticking with DBD for the long run. And I know this because in the comments of my other videos covering some of these individual perks and items, people talk about how they wanted to get into DBD, ended up playing against some of this ridiculous stuff, had zero fun, and subsequently never played the game again. So, circling back to what I said at the start of the video, I'm sure you can now see why some people absolutely do not think DBD used to be so much more fun in the past than it is nowadays. But that doesn't mean everyone who misses the old days was just a bully that spent every match harassing killers. In the past, playing Survivor was an absolute power trip, and every now and then it's nice to let loose, like getting a hero on Star Wars Battlefront 2. And in the end, things were much more simple and casual back then, and people do have a reason to miss that. So, what caused the downfall of bully squads and why don't we see them anymore? Well, to put it simply, balance changes and bug fixes. Infinite loops got patched, the hostage taking glitches got patched, dead hard bounce glitches got patched, the perks got nerfed, maps got changed, and the moonlight offerings got removed. Although it did take far too long, literally years, these ridiculous things did eventually get patched, and once again, the game might not be perfect now, but it is so much fairer than it used to be. And would you believe that back then, people were adamant that killers were OP, and that the devs quote-unquote babied killers? Crazy stuff. 
Thank you so much for watching and thank you for sticking to the end. If you have any other things you'd like me to discuss in a similar style to this video, be sure to let me know. You can catch me live on twitch.tv slash Ardita.